G'day folks, welcome to my channel. In this video, I wanna talk about the biblical canon. How do we know that the 66 books in our Bible today are the correct books that should be in there? And how do we know that there's not some other books that should have been included in the canon that we missed? Well, to answer that question, I've got a guest coming on the channel today by the name of Pastor Damien Pickett. And Pastor Damien Pickett was my pastor when I was living in the UK for about two to two and a half years. He's a church planter, he's a, an American church planting in the UK. He's planted and strengthened about seven churches in the UK. Uh, he's doing a fantastic job over there. He's currently uh, pastoring down sort of the south of England and he's also doing a church plant uh, in Bath, which is absolutely fantastic. And if you've ever wanted to support my channel, uh, I've never asked for money, but if you want to support anyone, I want to encourage you to support Damien Pickett and his church planting activity in the UK. I'll put a link to, in the description of the video for you to click on if you want to give to him. Uh, Pastor Damien Pickett has his BA in History and Biblical Studies as well as his Masters in History and he's on the channel today to help me answer the question, how do we know that the 66 books in our Bibles today are the correct books that should be there and how do we know that there shouldn't be some other books in the Bible that we miss. Let's get right into the conversation between myself and Damien Pickett. G'day Damien, how you going mate? I'm doing great, how are you? Yeah, good mate. Yeah, thanks for thanks for coming on the show um, today and I uh, really appreciate you taking the time to come on and uh, to help me answer this question. Um, hey, it, honestly, it's, it's my pleasure. By the way, just, just on a side note, uh, thank you so much for what you and the uh, I Think Biblically uh, ministry uh, has done for for me and for some of my sermons and things like that. Yeah, Thank cool. you for taking cool. back to part. Yeah, yeah. Did you like that sermon jam I did? Was it you like that? It's so cool, man. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, I listen to your sermons when I'm working, so it's good. I find a good one and then I'll you know make something out of it. So no, I really enjoy Thank making you. it. So it's, I learn a lot from you as well. So Thank you. yeah, cool. So <clears throat> the question, obviously, that we're here to answer is. We've got 66 books in our Bible. How do we right. know that these 66 books are the correct books? Uh, and how do we know that there's not some other books that should be in the Bible? And if we start with the Old Testament, how do we know that the books of the Old Testament, is there 39 books of the Old Testament? Yeah. Um, how do we know that those 39, all of those 39 books should be in there? And how do we know that there's not some other books um, that should have been included that weren't? Okay, and that's, you know, that's, that's reasonable because once we begin to say that the Bible is authoritative, once we begin to say that um, the canon is closed, the canon that we would describe as the books of the Bible, yep. uh, once we say that, you know, there's there's got to be some kind of evidence. It, was it just a bunch of random people that said, hey, this stuff is cool. Let's yeah. do that. And yeah. and actually, um, it isn't. Um, the, the most important thing is that, especially in the Old Testament, there was a, the very first question that people asked, okay, is, um, actually, let me rephrase this. They weren't chosen they were being regularly used. And then as the books are being regularly used, then people really began to ask questions. One of the questions that they asked um, was the person who wrote this or was uh, ascribed to write this, uh, were they in a uh, divinely appointed office, uh, such as a king, prophet, judge, yep. something like that. And, and the book may not say it directly, um, but the uh, history behind the book. Yep. And, and, and understand that we like things really nicely uh, written down. It's, it's nice and neat. We can turn to it. Yep. Uh, the oral culture of the Oriental mind was just amazing. Yep. And so some of these things were passed down orally, even though it didn't specifically say it. Another thing was, is that remember that the Old Testament was written well over a, a millennia, over yeah. a thousand years. Yeah. And so then the next question is, is it consistent? 
Because if one of the books, even though it might be used, even though people may like it, they might say, actually, this is a little bit more like fan fiction. Yeah. And uh, it's not consistent. And so, therefore, uh, we just can't accept it as God's word. I guess uh, it'd have to be consistent with the Torah, especially. Um, it has to. Yeah, because you know, we know that uh, the Torah was you know, given by Moses and that Moses wrote it down and you know, it, it was, it's obviously referred to by Christ as well as, you know, the, the books of Moses, Moses said, et cetera. We know that the law of Moses, and I suppose with the first one, we've got a king, a priest, and a prophet. So it has to be written by a king, a priest, or a prophet, and then it has to be consistent with um, the Torah and also the other accepted books as you kind of go down the list. Right, and, and also yeah. another question they ask is, is, is this uh, – was it relied on Israel as a foundation of their beliefs or how they lived? Right. Um, and then um, because, so you, you have a, a section of books called uh, the Kethabim. Yeah. Which were uh, the wisdom literature, like Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Okay. Then you had Psalms and historical literature. Yeah. Now, these books were actually the last ones to be accepted. Right. Now, when I say accepted, please don't read into that, that some council said, okay, we're now going to use these books. They were already being used. Yeah. So, um, the, it wasn't accepted until kind of uh, towards the, the end um, of the Old Testament, not because they weren't true, but because they didn't know if they were equal to the Pentateuch in writing or equal to the prophets, they said they were good. They said they were accurate. And that's really important. Right. These books that were added kind of towards the end of the completion of the Old Testament canon, there was, there was really no debate on their usefulness or on their veracity. The, they wanted to be cautious. Yeah. And that's what I really love. Uh, these people were extremely cautious. And even though they felt, yeah, this is a good thing, if it violates anything, no, we're just going to have to pause and yeah. we're going to have to reconsider it. Yeah. Kind of like the book of Enoch. Obviously, Enoch would fit the category of a prophet because Jude said, well, I'm not sure if I would, if we can say he was a prophet, but we can say that Jude said that he prophesied, obviously um, other people prophesied in the Bible that weren't prophets. Right. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but he, he prophesied and he was a man of God. And so the temptation is to kind of say, well, um, you know, is he a, is he a prophet and should his book be books be included? Obviously Jude quotes him. Um, and, um, I think you did a video already as well on, um, uh, the argument that people make that Jesus referred to, to the writings of Enoch as scripture. And you kind of point out the error in that, um, what kind of, what with this list that you're giving these, this criteria, where does Enoch fall short? And, um, you know, can you give me some examples of that? So I, I would say one of the big things is, remember, God promised to preserve his word. Yeah. And so we find all the books of the Bible, we find them very well preserved, very well copied by Hebrew scribes and everything like that. Yeah. Um, but with the book of Enoch, it's kind of these random things in Ethiopia. Right. And, uh, and just just be honest with you, there, there's some great solid Ethiopians out there. Nothing against Ethiopia as yeah, a whole, yeah, yeah. But it really has not been the the bastion of Hebrew faith, okay. Right. Yeah. And so there there is a concern with that. But even more importantly, you do have some things actually in the Book of Enoch that is contrary to many of the teachings that are throughout the Old Testament. Even when uh, even when Jude mentioned Enoch. Now we're, we're kind of pulling that into the New Testament, but, yeah. but even when uh, Jude mentioned it, uh, what's interesting is that throughout the Jude is talking about the sinfulness of man. The Bible talks about how sin entered through man. The book of Enoch, on the other hand, actually makes a different argument. They say it, uh, sin entered the world through angels, and we are sinners because of angels. 
And uh, there's there's a contradiction in doctrine there. We would yeah. we would literally have to change it. Also, the Hebrew people, they never used it. And I say never used it. I mean, I'm sure there was random people, but it it was it was never even in the debate. Right. Uh, yeah. See, some people will call them like lost books or things like that, and. And they're really not that. I, I would say Enoch is is obviously uh, it's not part of the canon. Yeah. But uh, it it could be some useful fan fiction. Yeah. Um, yeah. Gives okay. you kind of an, yeah g- gives yeah. you a thought of the things like that. But but once we we cling on to it and say actually this is scripture, then we have a problem because it, it, when it contradicts the Torah, when it contradicts so much of the Old Testament. Now we're left in a mess, and God just is not going to contradict His Word, yeah. not simply because it is His Word, but it's because He is the Word. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> were there any other books um, that um, were considered or that people today consider should be in the Old Testament that you're aware of? Well, you, you, have, uh, you have the Apocrypha. Okay. Yeah. And the Apocrypha, again, was kind of considered uh, useful writings. Um, the, the bell and dragon is part of Daniel. You, you have all these different things. And, and the weird thing is, is that uh, the Roman Catholic Church really didn't dig their heels in on the Apocrypha until the Council of Trent. And for those who aren't familiar with the Council of Trent, uh, that is in the 1500s when uh to combat the reformation to yeah. combat the protestants instead of the catholic church really taking a uh, uh an introspective look on what they're doing mm-hmm. they just dug their heels in right and that's really when the apocrypha became this is part of the canon yeah and it's always been debated yeah um but to dig their heels in, that's kind of why the Apocrypha is, uh, it, it is somewhat accepted. And, and it wasn't that people didn't use it. People did use it. But the veracity of it, mm. uh, did it teach strange doctrines, things like that. That's mm. why it was always rejected as Scripture. Because it was inconsistent with, the, with what we already knew and what was already accepted to be the Word of God. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Another question is um, when the King James was uh, published, um, <clears throat> it was argued, uh, well, I've, I've heard it said that um, that King James required that the Apocrypha be um, um, included in the publication of the King James. What's your thoughts on that? Yes. Yeah. So one of the problems that, that you had um, – uh, and and it's, it's really cool. Um, I've, I've got my master's degree yeah. uh, from Manchester Metropolitan University. Yeah. And my niche is actually this time period between Elizabeth the first and James. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. And, and one of, uh, so you had Elizabeth's father, Henry the eighth. Yeah. Uh, I won't say it was a conviction of conscience rather than he wanted a divorce. <laughs> and there were a lot of inconsistencies in the Roman Catholic church and he yeah. just did away with it. And he says, I'll be the head of the church. Right. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so that's just what happened. And and yeah. that's when, if you, it, you've been to England, you've seen all the yeah. ruined abbeys and the ruined yeah. things like that. That's because yeah. the monks wouldn't leave. So he says, I'll just rip down your buildings. You have no other choice. <laughs> right. Um, Wow. Yeah. <laughs> then, uh, then he had a son, and uh, when Henry VIII died, his son, who was actually kind of sickly, he was um, his reign was a little bit more hardcore Protestant. Right. Okay. He had a lot of Protestant reformers uh, that were advisors. Okay. His privy council. Yeah. Then he died, and then you have the reign of Bloody Mary or Queen Mary. Yeah. This was also Henry VIII's uh, daughter. The Catholic. Um, she was Catholic, wasn't she? Yeah, she was. As a matter of fact, her mom, uh, that, that's why Henry VIII got the divorce. Right. right. Because of her mom. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and she was uh, uh, her husband, king of Spain. Yeah. So they are 
very serious Roman Catholic. And, and today, you know, some people are Catholic just because they're Catholic, whatever. Yeah. But back then, uh, if, you, if you did not take every aspect seriously, your immortal soul was going to be in danger. Mm. Yeah. Okay. And th that really is what doctrine is now too, but yeah, people, of you know, they, they fiddle yeah. around with it. Yeah. So, so that were, it's not like just random non-practicing Catholics kind of thing. These were like Catholics because they really <laughs> believe this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That's when uh, English translations were burned. That's when the real persecution of believers, I mean, really, really was going on. There was some yeah. under Henry the eighth, but yeah. those were a lot of personality conflicts. Yeah. Um, okay. But under under um, Mary, that's yeah. why we call her Bloody Mary. Yeah. Okay. Now she dies. Yeah. Elizabeth the uh, first. Uh, th this is going to answer your question in a minute. Yeah. 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 No. No. It's good. No. Because I, I knew that you did your your masters in this area, so I, I was, you know, I was going to get your get your thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> so when when Elizabeth the first became queen, she had loyal subjects on both sides. Yeah. Okay. And so it came time to redo the common book of prayer. Okay. And so she decided to make both sides happy. Now, what happens when you try to make both sides happy? You got to come. Neither side is happy. <laughs> so so when, when they redid uh, the uh, common book of prayer, uh, the Catholics noticed that there was a lot of Protestant leanings and they hated it. Yeah. And the Protestants were like, hold on, this is very Catholic language. We hate it too. Right. And instead of unifying the country, it just kind of split it. Yeah. So when she died, James the fourth of, uh, of Scotland, whose mom, by the way, was a very serious, dedicated Catholic. All right? Yeah. Um, and when he came to the throne, the point was, uh, show us that you will kind of let us do what we want, that, yeah. that religion will be of our conscience, I will be beholden to our own heart, no one can go against my heart. Yeah. Okay? Okay. And so... They said, "Would you uh, create a English, an official English translation of the Bible?" Yeah, and yes, and there was pressure to make both sides happy. Yeah, to include the apocrypha. Okay, though it was done under protest. Right. Um, but yeah, that's why it was included. It's trying to make. Your Protestants and your so Catholics. I was trying to make happy. the Catholics happy, but the Protestants <laughs> never accepted the the apocrypha. Yeah, <laughs> right. And so, and so again, that's the reason why we see very, very soon um, uh, that that it's removed. Yeah. And uh, most Catholics didn't like it anyways because it was an English translation, not the Latin. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right, so that's kind of what was there any other criteria? So if we rehash the criteria, it's got to be uh, written by somebody in the office of a king, a priest, or a prophet. Something, something where it now, when I say divinely appointed, something where probably oil was, was put on them and they were properly uh, ordained uh, Old Testament wise. And wow. again, that's the reason why um, Psalms. Uh, there was there was some debate on Psalms. They accepted the you know King David. Yeah, but some yeah. of the other ones they they had questions about. So obviously Moses was a prophet. So that's the first five books of the Bible. Joshua, um, from the top of my head, I I can't think of him being, but he was obviously the next leader from Moses. So he right, was he was ordained. Leader. Remember that's okay. Right, yeah. So that's that. Then you've got uh, Judges, which I assume was written by Samuel. I think so. Yeah. Um, so you've got Samuel and then you've got first and second Samuel. Um, what's your thoughts on that? Who, who, I don't know if you've gone through this, if you've, you've committed this to memory or if I'm really pushing you here, well, <laughs> stretch your mind. Again, memory. first and second Samuel, first and second Kings, first and second Chronicles. Those were a little bit debated. Right. Not, not, and they knew they were accurate. Yeah. Again, they just were concerned about who did it. Right. 
And, uh, and there was, uh, w without going into specifics, there was enough evidence for them. And again, they were cautious. And I like it that they were cautious. Yeah, yeah. They weren't cautious because it was poorly written. They weren't uh, cautious because it caused dissent. They were cautious in that, okay, who wrote this? Yep, okay. It, it was accepted and everything like that. By the way, there were some some books that uh, were by some credible prophets and things like that. Okay. Um, but they weren't fundamental to Israel, and so they got rejected for that, or okay. that they weren't heavily used by the people, so it was rejected because of that. Okay. Um, a a uh, uh, somebody who's in a divinely appointed position could write something, but that doesn't make it biblical. Such as when we get to the New Testament. Um, Paul references two other books written, uh, letters written to the Corinthians. Yeah. And, um, and the epistle if, written if those, to the Church of Laodicea as well. Right. And yeah. if, those, if those letters ever showed up and they were um, uh, shown to be authentic, yeah. the important thing is, is that we can say, wow, look at these authentic letters. Maybe we can learn something from it, but we don't yeah. add it to the canon That's because right. the church never used it. Yeah. And I guess, you know, with, you know, my sheep hear my voice, a stranger, they will not follow. Um, and if it's not inspired by God, if it's not God's word, mm -hmm. you know, they, they yeah. won't have received it. Um, right. Being preserved. Not to say that it's false, not to say that it wasn't written by, you know, uh, someone important, et cetera. Um, but it wasn't the word of God. Um, and Correct. so therefore God's people didn't preserve it and keep it, which is really good for the book of Enoch. It wasn't preserved, especially in the Hebrew or Aramaic. Um, right. Okay, so that's your three criteria. It's got to be written by a divinely appointed person. Uh, it's got to be consistent with what we already know to be Scripture, and I guess the foundation of that would be the Torah and then the other books that we accept. It's got to be relied on as well by the people of God um, for their beliefs and the way mm. that they live their lives. And I guess when we get to the New Testament period, it's fairly settled, um, and we know that Jesus is referring, and Jesus and the apostles were referring to these various books as being the Word of God. When the New Testament cites them, it cites them as the Word of God, et cetera, and, and things like that. Yeah, yeah, and 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 you know, you're you kind of uh, I don't know if you're meaning to, but this is kind of a good segue yeah. that the New Testament had a little bit different criteria. Okay, um, even uh, be okay. So the Old Testament. Um, if you go to uh, Masada today, yeah. you'll see a rabbi who's actually writing uh, the Torah letter by letter, and you can see everything that he's doing. And it, it is it is a it is a very cautious, it is a very uh, painstaking uh, type of ordeal. And and if there's a, you just don't correct the mistakes. If there's too yeah. many mistakes, the whole scroll is done away right. with. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now. The New Testament is a little bit different yeah. because when these letters were written, the church knew who wrote them, mm -hmm. okay? And they knew that it was important. And sometimes they were even told, hey, copy these and send them out. Yep. Okay? And so immediately they started copying down and said, hey, Paul just sent this to us. Read this. Yep. And they wrote it. And, and that's the reason why um, you – you know, you will see some minor variants yep. in proper text, okay? Nothing that's destroying uh, yep. scripture, nothing that's destroying doctrine, nothing that's doing that. But you will see some changes only because if you and 10 of your mates decided to write the book of 1 John, yeah, okay, you love uh, 1 John, you, you believe it's scripture and everything like that. But chances are you making a human mistake is pretty high. Yeah, that's right. But so so because at the at the origin they knew that it was genuine, they started going off. And that really is the very first uh principle of how they um accepted a uh a New Testament book was uh was the author an apostle or have a close connection with an apostle. Okay. Uh, the book of Mark. Yeah. Okay. We we can we can say the gospel according to Peter. That might be a little bit more. 
<laughs> you know, yeah, okay. but Mark wrote it, but his close connection made it valid. Made it, Peter. So, um, yeah, I think it was Papias, wasn't it, that said that um, uh, Mark preserved the the sermons of Peter on the life of Jesus, and he preserved it in the Gospel of Mark. And that's um, quoted in Eus- Eusebius quotes Papias from the first century, um, pointing that out. So, so that's the association with the Gospel of Mark. Right. Yeah. And, and you have uh, Luke. Yeah. Um, Luke, again, very close. So he wasn't an apostle. Yeah. You know, um, but he, he was a close associate of Paul, would write down things from Paul, would write down. I mean, what an amazing historian he was yeah. and, and his purpose. And again, when the early church got it and read it, and this is kind of the second thing for the, uh, for the veracity of an Old uh, New Testament book is, was it largely accepted by the body of Christ? Yeah. And, and, and breaks were put on fast. Hold on a second. This, this has, uh, you know, what, what guy is trying to come in here and, uh, and, write, and, and try to tell us what to do? He has no authority. Mm. A lot of times, the ex, the, again, the lost books of the Bible, you will find coming uh, 2nd century, 3rd century, um, and there was a big thing about it a decade or two ago because Dan Brown wrote his Da Vinci Code. Yeah. And that's when uh, that's when everybody was like, ooh, the Gnostic Gospels. Yeah. They took out the Gnostic Gospels. Well, no, the Gnostic Gospels were centuries. It's interesting afterwards. that Dan Brown even said that uh, the Council of Nicaea determined the canon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <In his book. laughs> Number one, to say any council determined the canon is just wrong. Right. Because... The, the council simply said what is readily accepted and what is the evidence. Yeah. They, they didn't say, all right, this is what we're all going to believe now. Yeah. All right. And that, it, it, I mean, it just they looked didn't at what happen. was already accepted by the people, by the churches. Right. Yeah. Right. But the, o- the only other real problem with it is that um, I know everybody wants to use the council of Nicaea as the big bad boogeyman. Yeah. You know, everything bad with Christianity is is because of the Council of Nicaea. Yeah, and Constantine. Um, (laughs) Yeah. The Council of Nicaea, the books of the Bible weren't even discussed. Right. That's right. That's right. It was all Christology (laughs) and, and, yeah, Trinity and and stuff. And and you you, you might have some people here that go, oh, oh, no, no, it's the Council of Nicaea. But I promise you, you're getting this because of a Dan Brown heresy. Yeah. What was discussed... What Constantine wanted to have nailed down is the deity of Christ. Yeah, that's right. And, and I'll tell you what's interesting is this is kind of, th- there weren't any preacher fellowships back then because of the persecutions. Yeah, that's and right. Con- Constantine sent out an invitation and, and these people that were burned, maimed, mutilated, persecuted, they were all invited to come to Nicaea and to speak about the deity of Christ. They hadn't met before. Mm. Okay. Now, the reason why this is important is because when they all got there, every single one believed in the deity of Christ. Mm. Yeah, that's amazing. No one was against it. Yeah. There was a, a couple that debated, was, was there a point he became God or was he always God? Yeah. And um, yeah, that's right. And, um, yeah. And, and with that in mind, uh, you know, that that's that's when they started turning the scripture. And I'm telling you, it was only a handful of people that even debated that. And I'll be honest with you, there's many Christians that that without proper foundation, uh, they can wonder it and they can uh, they, you know, they can try to look at the Bible. But uh, that's the reason why I have to go to the whole counsel of God. Yeah. When we sing um, uh, uh, the, the Christmas song, it says, God of God, light of light. Yeah. That's actually a phrase that came out of the Council of Nicaea yeah. in AD 325. Right. So the Council of Nicaea had nothing to do <laughs> yeah. with, yeah. with, with uh, the deciding of, oh, uh, of the canon, and no council decided what was going to be in the canon. So they, they simply, there's never been a, a council that's decided the canon, like... 
an official council within you know the first thousand years or anything like that? So the, there were there was a council that said, look, this is what is readily accepted by all Christians. Right. They uh, it's done by an apostle or somebody from an apostle. The the body of Christ has used it from the very beginning. It's consistent with doctrine and orthodox teaching, yeah. and it, it, it bears evidence that it's a work of the Holy Spirit. Okay, right. Okay. Um, you know, and, and, and all those things are, are, are going on, and, and they said, okay, we, we agree that what the body of believers is using is authoritative. You, you go to, um, oh, what, what were the books? Uh, you go to the books of Hebrews, James, Second Peter, Second John, Third John, and the debates really weren't over doctrine. The debates were, and the debates weren't. Did the church use them? The debates were, who wrote them? Right. Um. Uh, just before we get uh, to that, can I just ask you a question? Sure. Um, with the other books, with the the four Gospels, uh, mm. the Epistles of Paul, um, right. and um, yeah, four Gospels and the Epistles of Paul. Was there any debate in the early church about those books belonging in the Christian canon, the biblical canon? Never. 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 Those were, I mean, of, of course, you probably have some oddballs, things like that. Yeah. But, but you, you read the early church fathers. Yeah. Um, and there's a, I think Zonderman put this out a while ago, but it was, it was a really cool encyclopedia uh, divided by subjects of just quotes by the early church fathers okay. on each subject without saying, um, without giving any type of uh, summary, it just gave the direct quote. Yeah. Okay. The, the early church fathers, it, because, because of the actions of the early church, see, we're debating it now because we're 2000 years away. Yeah. There was no debate in the beginning. Right. Because uh, um, e even when, uh, you know, when Paul wrote uh, about the resurrection, he, he says, okay, if you don't want to take my word, there's a lot of people that have seen it, mm. go ask them. Yeah. And uh, there, are, there are so many things about Paul, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and, and they were written for specific reasons. Yeah. John, John, again, uh, John and 1 John, uh, they're really combating the Gnostic heresy that was creeping into the church. By the way, um, it's really important that the very first hotly debated yeah. thing in Christianity yeah. was not the deity of Christ. It was the humanity of Christ. Right. <laughs> you know, you're like, yeah, I get that he's that's God. Right. How can he be human? And right. I'll be honest with you, I get it. You know, yeah, yeah that's <laughs> I think right. You and I have had some discussions of, about this, and um, uh, hey, so, we did, didn't we? I was right. Yeah, you were. You were spot on. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, I, I, I spoke to another group of, uh, of preachers, and literally nobody had even considered what what we were talking about, and. and uh -huh. uh, yeah, mm. Iron sharpened iron that day. That was oh, in the audio. Right. You were audio recording, and I was going, "No, nah, mate, no, nah, mate." <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I think I even said, "Caleb, you're wrong, but let's talk about it later." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good times, eh? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> it was. Um. So yeah. Um. Uh. Luke. Luke was written. Um to uh a, as a tool of witnessing to a man whether it was his real name or a pseudon pseudonym uh Philophilus, theophilus yeah um I, I would say mark mark being the first gospel penned I, I i think it was man people need to hear from an eyewitness of what jesus said and did mm. Because um, as false doctrine creeps into church, as um, Paul 
Paul came face to face with these people that, that were called like super apostles mm. um, who, who said they got secret knowledge and things like that. So there, there really need to be an authoritative uh, document that said, actually, this is what Jesus did. Mm. And this is, uh, this is why Jesus did what he did. And these are, this is what he fulfilled. Yeah. It's interesting to note as well that, um, that the four gospels that we have are the only four gospels that can be dated back to the first century, the, the, you know, the, the lifetime of the apostles. And right. what's really interesting is that the, the four gospels deal with um, theological debates and issues that were relevant during the lifetime of Jesus. Uh, yes. And, um, and they obviously name places and, and different customs and things that were relevant during the life of Jesus. But then when you read the Gnostic Gospels, they're more dealing with debates in the latter half of the second century, somewhere from like 150 to 200, 250. They're dealing with debates around that. They're not really dealing with debates that were relevant during the lifetime of Jesus. And that to yeah. me is a big um, sign that the four Gospels are the original Gospels and these Gnostic ones were later on uh, written to kind of help their debate and they put the names of some, you know, special person on the top to kind of give it some sort of uh, authority, you know. What was what was it, uh, the Gospel of Thomas? Yeah, the Gospel, you got the Infancy Gospel of Thomas and then the Gospel of Thomas, yeah. Yeah, I, I, uh, I actually um, was able to see uh, a church window that had scenes of uh of that book okay uh and it was it was kind of weird because uh when you go to church I, look I, I like seeing stained glass i like reading churches you know i i do i'm, I'm, I'm a nerd that way okay yeah um don't don't judge me too much <laughs> but uh what you, you look at this and and you're like, man, what's going on here? And 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 you look at it long enough, and and you can see the story because it, it, there were stories written so that you didn't need to read; you could just understand it. Hmm. And one of the stories was um, was uh, you know the the old carpenter's uh, mantra: measure twice, cut once. Right? Yeah. Well, Jesus accidentally cut a board too short, or maybe it was Joseph on this one. And uh, to help, yeah, it was Joseph. Did. And to help dad out, he stretched the board a little bit <laughs> so that it would fit. Which is interesting but, because that's a miracle for selfish reasons, you know. It's not a miracle to, to help, you know, a lot of the miracles of Jesus, they were to help the sick, the poor, the needy, not just for some little financial benefit, you know. Okay, side note, uh, <laughs> you bring that up. Do you remember... And I, I hopefully, hopefully you're old enough, but do you remember, um, uh, you know, during Christmas, do they know it's Christmas? Do they, do they know it's Christmas time at all? No. Anyway, I mean, I don't know it neither, brother, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, it, it was done by a bunch of English pop bands to raise money for Ethiopia, the starving right. people in Ethiopia. Um, the Americans put one together. And, um, and, you know, they were trying to um, really pull it all, all. It's called We Are the World, mm -hmm. which doesn't sound ecumenical at all. But <laughs> um, <laughs> and the phrase in there that, that Jesus showed us how to love by turning stone to bread. I'm like, well, actually... Yeah, that, that was a temptation sense, yeah. by Satan, and he never yeah. did it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Of those yeah. selfish reasons. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's and, right. And, and, and so many Christians just go singing the song and, and, you know, they say, oh, well, remember Jesus did that? I'm like, well, actually, yeah. no, no, we didn't. And, and, and if you will, may, maybe the, and I believe in a spiritual realm, but maybe humanly speaking, the person was, was trying to remember some Bible story and they were trying to do good and they were trying to, uh, you know, use a biblical example but when it comes under scrutiny, you go, hold on a second. This is not inspired. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you, you know, it doesn't have that ring of truth to it. Yeah. Right. It doesn't even make sense. Even even if he did do it, it doesn't make sense as to why that would uh, teach us how to love, you know. Um, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Especially when you know the context. Yeah. So it's kind of like 
that's that third criteria. Is it the third or the fourth criteria where it kind of just hits you? It's like, well, this, this it's out of sync with everything else. Yeah. Yeah, yes. that's that's you the know. third one for the New Testament. Yeah. 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 And by the way, most scholars are, are pretty much in agreement with these yeah. uh with, with these ideas they'll they might phrase them a little bit different but they'll say you know in doing all their research that that this was the criteria that they used yeah yeah so this isn't just something i've i've pulled out of the air so with the disputed book so we, with with the the gospels and the epistles of paul there was no dispute i'm not sure if Correct. there was a dispute with Ephesians or something or one of them or the the epistle uh the epistles to timothy maybe as well from the top of my head so there was there was a there was a um so Colossians was readily accepted. Right. Okay. Um but but and and the church used it and it was authenticated, but there was some people brought up maybe it's not from the apostle. Okay. And and what I like is that the early church was cautious. Yeah. Um Second, you know, why was second and uh, third John debated? Well, there is some doctrine in there, but not a whole lot. Yeah. Um, I've, uh, you, you know, again, you and I were talking about this uh, a few weeks ago, um, that a really good idea is maybe this was a cover letter yeah. that John personally gave that accompanied his epistle, first epistle. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, and, and you know that's that's very possible. Makes we just sense. know that that the debate was not who wrote it. Yeah, was it moral or anything like that? The debate simply was: is there enough doctrine in it? So that was the issue with with those short uh, uh, epistles, Second and Third John. The issue was not the author. Um, the right. issue issue was: was there enough doctrine in there? Was it useful? Yeah. Was it um, profitable for for the church? Yeah. Right. And and again, these are when the church received them, they knew exactly who it was from. They they copied it, they sent it out. And it's reasonable that people go, okay, these we, we don't doubt the authenticity. We don't even doubt that, you know, that they're they're morally good, but is it increasing our faith? Yeah. Now you go to Second John and yeah, uh, and Third John, it, it teaches, you know, that uh, we don't have to um, uh, be kind, if you will, uh, to false prophets. We don't have to uh, yeah, put them up. You, yeah. With, yeah. yeah, yeah, because that was that was one of the things that widows did when when widows were supported by the church. Widows took care of preachers. They they were very hospitable. Yeah, and there was a, and we know that there was kind of a guilt trip laid upon them, or or maybe even, ah, uh, I'm sure you've come in contact with some old Christian dears that, uh, oh, I, you know, I know this person's probably going to use this money for drugs, yeah. but, um, but you know, they're asking for it, and aren't I supposed to give? Yeah, and 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 it, it seems to be one of those things where there was a, uh where there was a question on is using God's resources to give respite mm. to a false prophet. Yeah. You know, no, you, you, you don't need to do that. As yeah. a matter of fact, don't even bring them in your house. Yeah. Yeah. That's really what it's talking about there as well. When it says, don't bring them into your house, it's not so much talking about, um, you know, inviting a Jehovah's witness in when he knocks on your door to debate with him. It's more talking about putting them up, and also bring him in, bring him into the fellowship because the church has met in their homes. So you're you're bringing them into the fellowship as well as yeah. them up. Yeah, and and that's why uh, it's really important that we do not base Christianity upon verses ripped out of context, mm. and even we don't base Christianity in our doctrine upon Bible principles. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm a very firm believer. What do you mean by Bible that, principles? So you, you'll have some people that, that will say, um, you know, in, in the Bible, uh, there, there's something called the law of first mention. Have you ever heard of that term? Yeah. 
that that however something is mentioned first in the Bible, that's the way it always is. Yeah. Well, d- dancing in the Bible, first time it's used, it's used under some pagan idea. And so that tells us that dancing is pagan. Okay. <laughs> and, when, and when David danced before the Lord, he was wearing a linen ephod and he was exposing himself. <laughs> and end of story, dancing's wrong. And and that's that's a Bible principle. Right. Okay. Yeah. Now I, I I would say sensual dancing's wrong. Yeah. But you go to a lot of cultures where the dancing is like the Jewish culture. You're gonna tell yeah. a Jew not to dance? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, is, they cross the Red Sea, they're gonna dance, you know. They're, they're yeah, living from Egypt, they they're dancing, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so that's an example. Um, you know, the Bible principle of, and, and this gets abused a lot of, um, uh, the, of, um, a man's not supposed to wear that, which pertains to a woman. Yeah. Okay. Um, of course, uh, that means that women, uh, can't wear trousers. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now yeah. I, I always like to say this. Um, when this was written, everybody was wearing dresses. I mean, yeah. robes. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, yeah. yeah, it was really interesting shoes. being in Europe that you, you see so many um, museums when because you're obviously you're in the UK, you're close to Europe. And when yeah. I was there, I went traveling and saw museums. So many um, uh, mod- um, statues and paintings and things from like the ancient times that, that are preserved in these museums have women actually wearing um, military uh, outfits and um, different types of types of clothing that could be interpreted as kind of male clothing, you know? So uh, I thought I found that quite fascinating when I was, when I was. One of my biggest things is because, uh, you know, there's some, and and again, uh, I I don't want to make fun of this because if somebody's conscience just says no i can't do this yeah. well romans 14 says we got to respect that yeah okay of course, yeah. but you know th- there's some that would say shorts are wrong because god told the priest not to show any of his thigh and okay but the the problem is is that priest was also wearing a skirt a yeah that's right yeah. <laughs> it was when he was going up so, the steps and his nakedness would right. be revealed from underneath so, so the question is, okay, I'll agree with you. Fine. Shorts are wrong, but do we now have to wear skirts? Yeah. <laughs> so that, that, that's what we mean by Bible principles. We've, yeah. we've got to have things nailed down because the word of God is authoritative. Yeah. And, and God is serious enough that if something violates his holiness, mm. if something violates his, uh, who he is, uh, he's more than capable of writing it down. Yeah, and preserving it. Which and preserving it. Yeah, which is interesting because, like the Gospel of Thomas and uh, a bunch of other Gnostic gospels, uh, they weren't found until like the 1900s. Um, because they were rejected. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, and, and it's kind of like you know, if I understand, if somebody doesn't believe in God. Then, then they can kind of say, well, you know, maybe these books should have belonged, et cetera. But if you do believe in God, then you would also have to believe that God would preserve his word and um, give his word to his people. And the fact that this, you know, these um, Gnostic gospels uh, were absent from the church community for, you know, over a thousand plus years um, tells us that, they weren't intended by God to be part of his preserved word. Yeah, you're, you're hitting it right on the head. Is it God's word? And if it's God's word, it, it is everlasting. He will preserve it. Yeah. He will not let it be missing for a millennia. Yeah. He will, you, 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 get, you, you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we have to take that very serious. Yeah. Um, because... Uh, I, I can take you to London. I, I can take you to the place where they they would gather up all the English translations and try to burn them. Yeah. I, I could take you uh, to places in Rome where where the Christians were persecuted and all the Christian writings uh, were were burned. And, and as a matter of fact, one emperor, his his sole goal was to eradicate the scriptures. Mm. And and they never went missing. Yeah. 
they were always used. Yeah. And, and the other thing yeah. as well is that yeah. um, from what I understand, I was listening to a lecture by Craig Bloomberg, Professor Craig Bloomberg, Craig Bloomberg today, and he was saying that just even to have Christian writings, um, you know, when, when the church was persecuted, you know, could, could land you in big trouble, imprisonment, um, torture, death. Um, so one of the reasons um, why one of the, you know, uh, motivations for trying to determine what books were right is to say which books are worth dying for, you know, which, mm. which books are worth your life. Um, and um, obviously preserving the word of God is worth our life. And, you know, people like William Tyndale are great examples of that um, in their translation work. And, but, you know, who risked their life for the apocryphal gospels, who risked their life for these other books you know uh, it seems as though well, the people that risk their lives preserve for us the 66 books that we have in our bible and, and funny enough you mentioned that uh with the apocrypha some risk their lives to say this isn't scripture <laughs> right yeah okay that's interesting i mean yeah yeah i mean but that's you, you have to stand up for the authenticity of god's word yeah um uh, you know when when it was first mentioned to me about like going back to the book of Enoch. You know, somebody sent me this website that all the times the book of Enoch is quoted throughout the scriptures. Mm. And I'm reading it and I'm like, one has nothing to do with the other. <laughs> it's it just, yeah, it, it might have mentioned an angel, but that was it. Or it might have mentioned poor or <laughs> you know, it might have mentioned... <laughs> a mini phrase or a big general concept. Yeah. And you can't yeah. take that as authoritative. Yeah. That's um, fine. you know, what, when Paul wrote to Timothy, he says, one of your own prophets said that, uh, you know, the Christians are, are lazy, uh, what, what slow bellied, I think is, you know, a uh, gluttonous. Yeah. 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 And, and, and the Bible describes him as a prophet. But I'm pretty sure he's not the kind of prophet that we're thinking of. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, he was just somebody respected, and yeah, and uh, yeah, I've listen. I've read. Um, somebody gave me a, a book about. I think it was called like the Lost Books of Eden. Okay. You know, and they said they said, "Man, read this." And I, I did. I, I read them, and there were some things that I read and I was like, this is so ludicrous and probably blasphemous. There were other things that there was, I remember one book that was talking about the blessings given to each son by Jacob, mm -hmm. you know, his 12 sons. Yeah. And I think it was written afterwards, but it was, it, it, it was kind of neat because everything that, that he blessed his sons with, you saw it come out later in their lives. Yeah. And, uh, and I, again, I keep on using that term. I would call that fan fiction. Right. You know, what would it look like? And when I read it, I, I, I go, yeah, I, I could see that. Not that I take it as scripture. Yeah. And pe God's but people didn't take it as scripture. Exactly. And it wasn't they written by somebody did. divinely appointed, you know, by God, anointed right. by God. Right. Because because they knew it. The people, the ancients weren't dumb. Yeah. We, a lot of times we think, oh, well, they, you know, they didn't know. Oh, they did. They, they did. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, the, I mean, I was listening to Michael Kruger. I've listened to quite a few of his stuff and uh, quite a bit of his stuff. And he, he says that the uh, New Testament scribes were innovative in their field. So they were the ones that invented the the book form, for example. Um, you know, in Manchester, where we both lived, you know, down the road from our place, you could go and see uh, P52 on display yeah. at John Ryland's library. Well, it's the yeah. first uh, uh, evidence we have of a book. It's a page, you know, on one side is the text, and then on the other side is what you would expect to correspond if it was a book. But before right. that, they used scrolls. So, so they were innovative in the fact that they developed the book form, the codex. So, so these were masters at their craft. Um, in addition to that, they, um, 
uh, created the abbreviation, the concept of abbreviations, which is why some of the manuscripts are different. You know, when people say there's 400,000 discrepancies among the, you know, thousands of manuscripts we have in the Greek New Testament. Yeah, but that's because you've got abbreviations and different things like this. So there's, as well as like, you know, slips of the pen and spelling mistakes and so forth. But it, if you go to, um, ones, yeah, yeah, you're, you're right. Um, I, I've had the privilege of looking at some of the old codexes. Right. Okay. And, and one of them, uh, the, two examples, and I, I can't remember the name of, of the codex, but um, when I took Greek, my, my professor showed me this. And you saw, you saw what a scribe was doing. He was writing, 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 writing. And then you saw kind of the pen go, yeah. Yeah, yeah. he fell asleep. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and then you see this big chunk missing. Yeah. And, and then it carries on. Right. And why is the big chunk missing? Well, obviously, to fill it in later. Yeah, okay. um, right. Yeah, you know, and, and he never and I, did. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. But I, I love that. Yeah, because because you see how these things, you see how these things were done. You see the innovations that you were saying. Why? Hmm. Um, it wasn't because they were making money off of this. Yeah, yeah, they're risking their they were, lives. Hmm. They were risking their lives. They were, they were doing everything they could to get the word of God out. And Caleb, I, I think a lot of people, they don't quite understand that we live in an anomaly. Mm. What I mean by that is our, our lack of serious persecution for generally Europeans, North Americans, Australians, mm. um, is, is quite unusual. Mm. And we're beginning to see it pick up. And when I say we're beginning to pick up, I don't mean, you know, we're seeing people burned at the stake, but we're seeing some of the same type of persecutions that happened to people in the Bible. They were losing their jobs. They were being uh, despised, mm. um, not for being jerks, but just for being a believer. Mm. Uh, they were considered antisocial because of certain things that they couldn't do. Mm. And, uh, but, but we forget that there's more persecution going on. There's more Christians that have died in the last century than mm. in the other 1900 years. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Wow. And so, yeah, you, you, North Korea, if you're caught with a Bible and this is not, um, I'm not saying this uh, just superfluously. I, I mean this. If you're caught with the Bible in North Korea, you're shot. Mm, wow, it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. If um, you, and it's and it, and people go, well, actually, this is this is important enough. And they don't care if it's uh, King James or the New American Standard <laughs> Version. <laughs> you got any of debate. that? You're shot. Because <laughs> they're scared yeah. of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, North Korea used to be known as the Jerusalem of the East. Yeah. Right. Really? The gospel. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. yeah. And it, it's when the communists took over that that was heavily eradicated. Wow. Crazy. Yeah. There's a there's a ministry. I, you know, um, I hope you don't mind me mentioning it, but there's a ministry called Platform 67. Um, I think you met that came to your church. Yeah. Yeah, they, they wow. did. And, yeah. and, and their goal is just to help preachers on the ground get the gospel out they have uh, they have like little mini mp3 players yeah, solar powered solar powered with yeah, like that's so good yeah little, little headphones and it can be hidden it you know so many things can be done with it yeah and they're being scattered yeah platform 60 second uh, six, 60 what platform seven 67 67 like six, yeah, i think six you books can, in the um, Bible. yeah i think it's like a a couple of bucks or something for one of these things and they send them out and you can, you know, donate yeah. towards it. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. 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 And, and, and they, they work. Yeah. And that's crazy. And again, what is. They do it in Iraq too. They've got it in Arabic, the Bible in Arabic. Yeah. They do. Yeah. They do. Um, yeah. Um, Farsi and uh, just so many different languages yeah. because it's, it's vital. And, and we're, we're seeing, 
as as we're panicking because of Christianity dying in the West, and I know it's really hard to call Australia the West, but I'm going <laughs> to lump you guys in there. We, we do refer um, to ourselves as part of the West, yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, even though we see Christianity struggling, yeah, you know, uh, and we're panicking, rightfully so. Yeah. But we're seeing other places around the world that are grabbing a hold of it. Yeah. They're and they're pushing it forward. Mm. And and they're not looking to be a Christian nation. Yeah. They're not looking to have Christian leadership. They're looking to see people believe the gospel. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. We think that we're the center of Christianity, but really these places have got more Christians and we've got people in our countries. You know? <laughs> <laughs> right. Some- uh, I heard a, a pretty credible, and what, when he said it, I was just like, what? They said that um, they believe that there's uh, 10% of China would be considered born again. Really? Wow. Okay. Now, uh, 10% sounds like a lot, but if that's true, that's over 100 million. Yeah. Yeah, well, they, yeah, that's right. That's crazy, isn't it? That's insane. Yeah. <laughs> that's more, that's yeah. like uh, Australia is what, 26 million, 27 million people. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, crazy. Yeah. Where are we at uh, with the canon? Have we got um, more stuff to go or, or we, what's your, what's well, your no, thought? I think, I think um, you know, the, the, the big thing about the canon is let's stop paying attention to the myths. Yeah. Um, because we like myths. We like conspiracy theories. Yeah, yeah. That's what makes we- YouTube channels blow up. If I do a big <laughs> headline video, then people will click on it. You do a teaching video on prayer or something and, you know, you get hardly <laughs> any views, you know. <laughs> yeah. And that's why these yeah. things are so sensational. But for the early church that was serious about the Word of God, the idea of the Gnostic Gospels and this sort of thing, they didn't even consider that worth um, the time of day to kind of consider to be in the Word of God. Right. If, if you will, it's like, um, you know, maybe people, uh, if, if, if the Lord doesn't return by then, maybe people a thousand years from now yeah. will, will try to fight that, you know, the Book of Mormon is one of the lost books of the Bible. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a great comparison, isn't it? Yeah. And, 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 you know, it's not because those believers have said, no, it contradicts Scripture. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's, not, it's not readily believed. It's not even readily believed in their own universities. Yeah. And in and, and saying that, I mean, it's, it, it really is a serious matter because – what, what was what was the first lie? Yeah. Did sure. God really say? Yeah, that's right. And and when when Christians don't even know if they can trust their Bible, man, that that does something to your confidence in not just your relationship with God, but also your ability to tell other people about Christ. Mm, that's right. And and look, that's. Uh, I know that's your heart. You know that's my heart. Yeah. Man, I want to see people born again. I want to see people, you know, get it, get excited about that. But it, if, if, I, if my mind puts me on a shaky foundation, mm. how much confidence will I have? Yeah. That's right. Oh, well, thanks for coming on the show, Damien. I really appreciate it. And, um, yeah, and uh, – yeah, I'll keep making sermon jams out of your sermons. <laughs> Man, I, I love it. I, I really do. Um, I, I've just been having a ball with them. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, they're great. And uh, and and seriously, thank you for for your ministry. Yeah, thank uh, you. of what you're doing because it's it's a voice out there. There there's a lot of sensational voices out there, and yeah. and I know sometimes we like doing clickbait. Uh, yeah, and I don't mean that in a negative way because sometimes you'll see clickbait and they say, wait to the end of the video and still yeah. nothing happens. <laughs> yeah, that's so, right. <laughs> but it is, it's, it's one where uh, a headline is used uh, to grab somebody's attention. Yeah. Uh, my, my, I remember one time my pastor, he preached 
And then, uh, and then he said, uh, in, in our bulletin, it said next week's sermon will be why baptism saves. Right. <laughs> you know, everybody's, they're angry, you know, we come to church next week. And he's talking about the baptism of the spirit. That, yeah. that, when, <laughs> that when we trust Christ, the baptism of the spirit completely changes us yeah. from the inside out. Yeah. We're, we're like, okay, I get it. Yeah. Then a couple of weeks later, next week's sermon is why water baptism saves. <laughs> oh man, he's lost the plot. You know? and, and, and then it says it saves not from the, the filth of the flesh, but from a guilty conscience yeah. towards God. Yeah. Okay. You know, and the idea is, is um, we have these platforms yeah. to, to not just put out material, but also to get people thinking. Yeah. And th this is so important because we are such a consumer uh, orientated people. We just kind of, whatever you're going to shovel in is fine. And if I happen to yeah. stumble on, uh, on something that is uh, heretical. Yeah. Okay. As long as I don't make it too bad. Um, I mean, there's got to be some truth to it because they put it out. Mm. They have a YouTube channel dedicated to it. So there's got to be something there. Yeah. I did a video just on the same thing where I titled the video The Mentally Unstable Christian. And it was um it was a Paul Washer sermon jam. I don't know if you're familiar with Paul Washer. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um yeah, it was a Paul Washer sermon jam. And I had so many atheists on there. And um yeah, people like I remember people even messaging me saying that uh that they wanted to trust in Christ and get saved, you know. Um, and a lot of atheists were saying, I can't believe I stumbled into the Christian section of YouTube, you know, <laughs> and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, no. So it was really yeah. good. So that was great. That, so the titles, yeah. the clickbait titles are great. They get people to watch the videos. So right. yeah, the materials sound great, you know. It combats all the craziness out there. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. It, you're, you're, you're the shock jock of YouTube. <laughs> trying to be. <laughs> cool. Thanks, Damien. Thanks for your um, time. I really appreciate it. And um, we'll have to do this again on, on another topic. And Man, um, I, I've, I've had a ball with this. This has yeah, been cool. great. Yeah, great. Me too. Oh, it's been great. It's been smooth sailing all the way through. So um, it's been excellent. So, um, yeah, I'll, um, I'll catch you later and I'll see you in the next video. All right, man. God bless. Cool. See you, mate. Bye. Well, folks, I hope you liked that video. If you did, consider subscribing to Damien's YouTube channel, Just the Bible. I'll put a link to it in the description below. And I'm currently working on his website to put all of his verse by verse studies through the Bible on his website. So check out what's there and keep an eye out for the sermons that will continue to be uploaded to his website. I've got a whole pile I've got to put up for him. And I want to encourage you, watch his sermons I've enjoyed them immensely and I think you will too. I'll see you in the next video.